John, thank you for that introduction. It really is an honor to be with you all today. And while I typically prefer extemporaneous remarks, today I'm going to follow William Buckley's advice uh, to pay the audience the ultimate compliment of delivering a prepared speech. Uh, uh, let me also say that I think we're going to have plenty of time for questions and hopefully answers afterwards, so I look forward to exchanging ideas with you uh, shortly. Uh, at, the, uh, at the outset, though, this is just a tremendous group of individuals, and congratulations again on your 10th Annual International Conference on Climate Change. Uh, appreciate the efforts that so many people made to be here today. Uh, appreciate your having the courage of your convictions, which is more important than anything else. And I especially appreciate the Heartland Institute's fact-checking the administration's claims about climate change. And on that subject, I know he is not here today. He's a friend from San Antonio. Jeff Justin is a board member. Uh, but uh, I just want to compliment him in his absence in hopes that the word will get back to him that I did so, uh, that recently he wrote an op-ed in a hometown newspaper that basically dismantled an editorial that, it had, pre that had appeared the week before, uh, saying that there was really no debate left. And Jeff did a wonderful job of countering that. Well, as chairman of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, which has jurisdiction over several government agencies that John mentioned, including the EPA, it is my responsibility to ensure that the federal government is efficient, effective, and accountable to the American people. Regulations should be based on sound science, not science fiction. Earlier this year, the House passed, it was a bill that I introduced, passed the Secret Science Reform Act of 2015. And in my view, this will greatly improve transparency and accountability at the EPA. The bill simply requires the EPA to base its regulations on publicly available data, not secret science. Uh, <clears throat> this, this strikes me as being a minimum requirement for government activities paid for by U.S. taxpayers. The administration itself has supported public access to the underlying data. In 2012, the President's science advisor testified that, quote, and this was before our committee, absolutely, the data on which regulatory decisions are based should be made available to the committee and should be made public, end quote. And the chairman of the EPA's own advisory board testified that EPA's advisors recommend, quote, that literature and data used by EPA be peer-reviewed and made available to the public, end quote. This allows independent scientists to evaluate the studies that the EPA uses to justify its regulations. That's called the scientific method. But the EPA now opposes it. It makes you wonder what they are hiding. When the EPA refused to release the data it uses to justify its Clean Air Act regulations, the Science Committee issued its first subpoena in 21 years to retrieve this information. Um, um, by the way, I have since issued a second. We're on the verge of a third, so you can tell I'm warming to the task. <laughs> reports then surfaced. This is after the clean air regulations and the subpoena. Reports then surfaced that EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy deleted almost 6,000 text messages sent and received by her on her official mobile device. It was either, she used a Blackberry part of the time and an iPhone part of the time, both official devices, 6,000 messages. Yet she claimed unbelievably that only one message was official. That was when we realized that she and Hillary Clinton must share the same private email server. <laughs> the committee issued a second subpoena last March to obtain the relevant documents and information, and we are still waiting for those records. McCarthy is not the first senior EPA official to disdain Americans' right to know. Last year, a federal judge held the EPA in contempt for disregarding a court order not to destroy records. In that case, former EPA Administrator Carol Browner asked an employee to delete all her, as well as other senior officials' computer files. Her excuse was that she wanted to have some games removed from her computer. <laughs> Yes, she was playing games all right. 
Not long after the contempt finding, reports surfaced that former EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson created a secret email account, you've heard of this, under the pseudonym Richard Windsor in an apparent attempt to conceal her emails. And last March, a federal court issued an opinion raising concerns about the agency's process for responding to Freedom of Information Act requests. A federal judge called the EPA's handling of a 2012 FOIA request suspicious. The court found that, quote, the agency either intentionally sought to evade the FOIA request in order to destroy documents or demonstrated extreme apathy and carelessness, end quote. This same discredited EPA now seeks to pursue the most aggressive regulatory agenda in its 44-year history. One regulation that is on the horizon is the Obama administration's sweeping new electricity regulation, the so-called Clean Power Plan. The President's power plan, of course, is nothing more than a power grab. It will give the government more control over Americans' daily lives. These regulations stifle economic growth, destroy jobs, and increase energy prices. That means everything will cost more, from electricity to gasoline to food. EPA justifies their dictatorial approach by claiming their regulations will slow global climate change and reduce carbon emissions. But heavy-handed regulations and arbitrary emission targets will do lasting damage to our economy, all for little environmental impact. In fact, EPA's data show that this regulation would eliminate less than 1% of global carbon emissions and would reduce sea level rise by only one one-hundredth of an inch, the thickness of three sheets of paper. Maybe we should limit the EPA's regulations to only three pages. <laughs> <laughs> And, and a couple of weeks ago, the EPA submitted its final rule to define the waters of the United States. This is the EPA's latest attempt to expand its jurisdiction and increase its power to regulate American waterways, even if that means invading Americans' own backyards. While the draft rule raised many questions as to which bodies of water the EPA will claim under its jurisdiction, the final rule is much more specific. As many had predicted, EPA has claimed unprecedented jurisdiction over many different bodies of water, including those tempor that temporarily result from a drizzle. That is the exact word that the EPA uses, drizzle, otherwise defined as light rain. Under this regulatory regime, Americans will face more permits and the constant threat of government intervention. So the onslaught of EPA regulations continues. The administration's regulations appear to be designed to ensure more government control of the lives of the American people, again with little environmental impact. EPA's own regulatory impact analysis states that, quote, the proposed new source greenhouse gas standards will result in negligible CO2 emission changes, energy impacts, quantified benefits, cost, and economic impacts by 2022, end quote. This is the definition of all pain and no gain. Further, the White House's climate assessment implies that extreme weather, hurricanes, and severe storms are getting worse due to human-caused climate change. The President claims that droughts, wildfires, and floods, quote, are now more frequent and more intense. But this is contradicted by the underlying science from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. So the administration keeps spreading intentionally what they must know is misinformation. For instance, the IPCC found that there is, quote, low confidence on a global scale that drought has increased in intensity or duration. The same lack of evidence can be found in the IPCC reports for almost every parameter of extreme weather events. Americans are tired of the administration's scare tactics. We should focus on good science rather than politically correct science. Administration officials and the national media regularly use the impact from hurricanes, tornadoes, droughts, and floods to justify the need for costly climate change regulations. But hurricanes, to take that first, have not increased in the U.S. in frequency, intensity, or normalized damage since at least 1900. Government data also indicate no association between climate change and tornado activity. Whether measured by the number of strong tornadoes, tornado-related fatalities, or economic losses associated with tornadoes, the latter half of the 20th century shows no climate-related trend. The science is clear and overwhelming, 
but not in the way the president says. The fact is, there is little evidence that climate change causes extreme weather events. A news release earlier this year by NASA shouted that 2014 was the warmest year on record. But the release failed to mention that scientists were only 38% certain that that was accurate, less than 50-50. Of course, few media outlets reported this lack of certainty. By the way, you're probably the most educated group on all these issues. How many of you had, third of, had heard of that 38% certainty? Well, like I say, you're educated, but not everybody else is. <laughs> Despite the intense media coverage given to climate change, the American people, for good reason, still are skeptical. This is the most amazing poll I have seen all year. A recent Gallup poll revealed, and this is, was printed in USA Today, the only publication I'm aware that used it. A recent poll revealed that a 43% plurality of Americans feel climate change is generally exaggerated, and only 31% think it is generally underestimated. We represent the new silent majority. While the, media, <laughs> while the media constantly bombards Americans with some statistics, others are, regularly, uh, are rarely reported. For example, if all the gases in the atmosphere were represented by the length of a football field, only the last one-tenth of one inch would be carbon emissions caused by humans. It's hard to imagine that small amount would result in the extreme consequences often predicted. Perhaps the most famous climate change alarmist is former Vice President Al Gore. His 2006 movie, An Inconvenient Truth, communicated massive amounts of misinformation to the public about climate change. Nearly a decade later, many of Vice President Gore's predictions still inconveniently have not come true. <laughs> Even a high court in the United Kingdom pointed out inaccuracies and scientific errors in the film. Perhaps most famously, Mr. Gore used polar bears as poster animals to prove that climate change is real and impacting our planet. Mr. Gore cited a study that said climate change had led to drowned polar bears. Subsequent evidence determined that these polar bears, however, likely drowned because of a storm, not climate change. Similarly, the administration does not let the facts get in the way of their agenda. The administration routinely claims that 97% of scientists agree that climate change is very likely caused by humans, a bogus number we have heard all too often. In testimony before the Science Committee, a lead author of the IPCC said it best, quote, this estimate just crumbles when you touch it. The source of this myth is a discredited study that attempted to categorize scholarly articles on climate change by the position the papers took on the issue. But most of the papers never took a position on climate change, and those that did seldom concluded that climate change was, quote, very likely caused by humans. So the 97% figure is a huge misrepresentation. Also, the sample size was so small that the study was determined to be invalid by four highly respected scientists in the peer-reviewed Science and Education Journal. By providing accurate information on climate change, but providing accurate information on climate change is not important to climate change alarmists. Their agenda comes first and the facts come second. That is why we need the Heartland Institute to continue to provide fact-filled perspective that benefits the public and informs scientific debate. Thank you again for trying to prevent Americans from being burdened by many costly and unnecessary regulations that are often justified by spurious science and a liberal political agenda. Good to be with you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, let's do questions. No, 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 no. Thank you. Thank you for such a wonderful presentation, and thank you especially for your courage, standing up for transparency in science, taking on federal agencies that are doing everything possible to hide the science and hide the data. This is the scientific method that Congressman Smith is fighting for. It's something that he is getting pilloried for, but he's standing up for each and every one of us in this nation by doing so. He's standing up for science. Thank you so much, Congressman.
We do have time, and Congressman Smith is kind enough to accept some questions from the audience. So uh, let's start. Do we have a microphone that we can distribute? There we go. John Noderft. Representative Smith. Can I have uh, let me, let me uh, say at the outset, just so you know that I'm um, not doing something arbitrarily, that we are expecting votes at 125, so I'm going to need to leave pretty close to that time. I have no idea what it, time it is now, but uh, I hope we have time for at least a, f a few questions. Representative yes. Smith, may I start by thanking you for one of the best informed, most passionate, and splendid speeches on climate I've ever heard from any my, politician. My God. <laughs> and and, and for, for the record, we have never met or talked before, right? And uh, thank you for your $1,000 donation. <laughs> <laughs> delivered in a brown envelope. Uh, sir, I would like to speak to you today on behalf of one of my distinguished co-authors, Dr. Willie Soon, yeah. who has been treated with brutality by the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, where he has worked blamelessly as a distinguished and award-winning scientist for the last 25 years. I would like you to contrast the treatment of him with the treatment of Joel Schwartz by Harvard University. Joel Schwartz having failed to disclose a $31 million series of grants he had received from the EPA when he was writing a paper about the EPA praising its new anti-coal, anti-humanity, anti-America regulations. Sir, would I, may I please ask you formally now to agree that once I have sent to your staff the paperwork on these two cases, which is comprehensive but very well organized, will you please establish immediately a congressional investigation into the conduct of the Harvard Smithsonian and of Harvard University, and will you please subpoena <laughs> Now, now you're getting the audience all excited. Uh, <laughs> let me respond real quick. I was, with, I was with you as far as getting the materials and, and reading them and, and trying to uh, digest them. I'll have to look to see whether we can go forward with an investigation or not. Some people might accuse me of being slightly biased because there, some people think there's a rivalry between Yale and Harvard and that I would be doing it for personal reasons. <laughs> so, but I'll certainly take it seriously. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Myron Ebel, Competitive Enterprise Institute. Uh, Chairman Smith, I, I hope everybody in the room will get behind your Secret Science Reform Act because it's very important. Uh, the other thing I would like to mention, though, is you talked a lot about FOIA. The, the, the administration is hiding one thing after another through endless delay. Yeah. And let me just give you two examples that you mentioned. Uh, my colleague, Chris Horner, uncovered the existence of Richard Windsor, and he also uh, filed the request for uh, Gina McCarthy's text messages. The EPA has said that a reasonable delivery schedule for 120,000 Richard Windsor documents is 100 documents a month for the next 100 years. <laughs> now, and they, they are trying to get away with that, and we yeah. have to go to court this is just outrageous. They, they are, yeah. Every scandal will come out 10 years from now. Yeah. I've read the same statistics that you have. I think it's remarkably, um, remarkably telling that many of the media today who are normally supportive of this administration are complaining about the lack of transparency, the lack of ability to have their FOIA request uh, responded to in a, in a timely manner. So, uh, you know, all you can do in these kinds of situations is build public support for our position and uh, hope that we will uh, get an assist either from the courts or in some cases from the media. But I'm totally sympathetic to what you just said. I'm going to digress just for a second because in front of you and in front of me are the two youngest members of, uh, of the audience today, these two boys. And I went and said hello to them early, but I'm just glad that their parents felt that they could bring their sons here and that they could listen to what's going on and maybe they're future scientists themselves. So I uh, appreciate that. <laughs> Other comments? We have, uh, oh, sorry. we have time for one more question. Okay. All right. Right uh, here. Okay, sorry. Yes. I'm from Texas, so you got to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've since moved, but I was born and raised there. I'll never, never end being a Texan. Congressman, 
$2.6 billion a year is granted in research funding for global warming research it owned by the National Science Foundation. It only goes to those who research and prove that global warming is real. Can't Congress cut off the money? The money, power of money is enormous. If you cut off the money, we're all done. We won't have any more conferences. The problem will be solved. <laughs> Thank you, Congressman. Uh -huh. Cut off the money. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. This, this is a good question to end on because, frankly, it's pretty much of a slow ball over home plate. Uh, and I probably should have mentioned this before, but we have done that in two different ways just in the last couple of weeks. And I'm glad you asked about it. I, I should mention it. Uh, one, uh, we have, just going into a little bit of detail, believe it or not, NASA, uh, which you all think of as being a space organization, uh, spends a lot of money um, researching climate change, uh, earth science, they call it. Uh, we cut NASA's budget on Earth science something close to 40 percent last week. And, the, and um, the, the, reason, the reason we did it, there's, there, there's only one agency that is involved with space exploration. There are a dozen other agencies dealing with climate change. So let's let NASA do what NASA does best, and that is explore space. Uh, the second cut we made, which is what you'll appreciate, it, is in the National Science Foundation that we also had jurisdiction over. Uh, we moved, we just set priorities, which we're entitled to do, and we moved a lot of money out of some of the social sciences into the hard sciences that typically yield better results. There's still plenty of money for the social sciences, but we're trying to get the National Science Foundation out of the business of awarding grants such as $800,000 for someone to write an off-Broadway musical on climate change. And so um, uh, we're trying to do exactly what you just said. We're going to need some help from our friends on the other side of the Capitol, and that's where Jim Inhofe, a classmate from the House, uh, can be helpful as well. Thank you all again for all you're doing. <laughs>